Um, it was last October when the world seemed to be falling out of our, the bottom seemed to be falling out of our financial world that our three organizations decided to hold this conference um, with the idea of both taking stock and looking ahead and definitely looking to the future rather than looking to the past. And in particular to address the three questions that we have for our panels later on today, um, are current policy interventions working? Number one, what regulatory systems do we need to prevent future financial crises? Panel number two, and what is the future of the financial services industry? Panel number three. Um, we felt that New York was the appropriate place to hold this conference. Um, we felt that late April, to coincide with the IMF World Bank meetings, um, was the appropriate time to hold it. And since it will clearly take a collaborative effort to map the future for us, we felt that we needed to gather together um, a group of leading government policymakers, uh, central bankers, regulators, and financial services professionals for this conference. Um, the one question we couldn't answer then um, was who would show up, and thank you for answering that question for us this morning. Um, we thank you for coming. We congratulate you on being prescient enough to book for this conference in time to get on the guest list rather than the wait list, and we're delighted to see you all here today. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robin, Dr. Robin Niblett, the director of Chatham House, both to introduce our keynote speaker of the morning and to chair our first panel. Robin, thank you. Thank you, Richard. And uh, let me also add my words of welcome here um, for all of you to join us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be working with uh, Noel Latif at the Foreign Policy Association and with Richard and his team at British American Business. Um, Global Financial Forum obviously has one of those generic sort of sounding things to it, and certainly when you say financial crisis, taking stock and looking ahead, uh, I think it captures the situation most of us feel we're in right now, which is trying to make sure that the situation right now isn't getting worse, at the same time as trying to look ahead uh, and see th how things are getting better uh, into the future. And we hope to cover both of those dimensions uh, through the course of today. Um, this is an important moment, certainly from a Chatham House perspective. It's as a British-based institution. Uh, it's quite exciting to be over here in New York at this time. Uh, perhaps for us to, A, share uh, our own thoughts of what we're picking up uh, from this dimension over in the United Kingdom, and we've got some uh, quite powerful uh, speakers over from Britain, uh, Lord Turner in particular, joining us uh, later on uh, in the program. Uh, and also, obviously, as I'll introduce in a minute, an absolute pleasure to have Christine Lagarde with us now, then Jean-Claude Trichet with us uh, later on today. Um, we're at a moment where people think things are getting a little bit better. Certainly if you read the press uh, and you look at the stock markets, there seems to be a, a sort of bottoming at one level. On the other hand, if you read other parts of the press uh, and you look at the stress tests that are being undertaken at the moment, there's a fear that these stress tests may reveal even greater concern uh, as we go forward. What we're going to do at the mor in the morning panel is have an opportunity first uh, to have a conversation and hear from remarks uh, from Christine Lagarde, uh, the Minister for uh, Finance, uh, Economy and Employment. Uh, in France, um, and then we're also going to be able to uh, move forward and have a conversation, as I said, with Lord Ter Turner and the rest of the panel uh, thereafter. So it'll be in two sections that we'll be running uh, this morning part. I want to say a couple of quick things. This all uh, meeting is on the record, um, and uh, you do have bios for all the speakers in your packs, um, so I'm not going to be doing uh, long introductions. Um, I think what I'd like to do right now is simply say some words of introduction for Christine Lagarde, who took her position uh, as Minister for Economy, Finance uh, and Employment um, just in 2007, a little under two years ago. Uh, she'd held briefly prior to that the position for Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, and prior to that uh, had also served as Minister uh, for Trade. Um, but this government service followed uh, a long period working in the private sector, uh, most specifically uh, at Baker at McKenzie, where she was uh, chairman of the Global Executive Committee and then became chairman of the Global Strategic Committee in 2004 and led what is one of uh, the world's largest international uh, law firms. Uh, she'll be kicking off our discussions here today. We're talking a little bit about government intervention, uh, the difficulties, the successes, the opportunities. Uh, Christine Lagarde, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We look forward to your remarks. Thank you very much, Chairman. I was so pleased that you introduced me because those of you in the room who don't know me might have thought, given the two flags that are behind me, that I had changed job. <laughs> and given that the flags are not there as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm going to add one question to the list of questions that were mentioned. And I'm just going to ask whether the world has gone French. 
Now, if you remember when the US government um, stepped in to save Fannie and Freddie in early September, there was one Republican senator who woke up in the morning and made a statement. He said, and I quote, I thought I woke up in France. A few months later, an American editorialist titled his article, I quote again, how we became the United States of France. Then this past March, and this is something that I'm happy to share with you, uh, although it was uh, mentioned and quoted in the Financial Times, a very eminent British politician, uh, Lord Mandelson, who is Britain's business secretary, praised France's economic model, even asserting, and I quote again, we have something to learn from continental practice, which is part of Europe, you know, the rest of Europe is the UK. <laughs> now one thing that the Financial Times did not mention is that he came to visit me and we, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, tax credit on research and development, uh, about clusters and the policy that we're putting in place to encourage our companies to invest in uh, research and development and to really sustain the innovation uh, pattern. And as he walked out of uh, my office down the stairs, he had to go through this hall which has the uh, either the, the, the statutes or paintings or photos of uh, French ministers of economy and finance since many, 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 many years ago. And he just paused and looked at this beautiful statue of Colbert, who was the minister of economy of Louis XIV. And he looked at Colbert's uh, top and he said, hmm, in my old days, I might become a, a neo-Colbertist. <laughs> Interesting. So has the world gone French? In the last several months, government intervention in the economy has been massive. And if you look at the World Economic Outlook that is published by the IMF, you will see that uh, measured by IMF standards, and might come back to that in a minute if you have any interest, uh, in 2009 and forecasted for 2010, the stimulus packages uh, put together by countries that are determined uh, to increase, boost and restore uh, growth amounts to pretty much 2% of GDP on a global basis. As far as France is concerned, we've invested in a stimulus package over 2009-2010 over 50 billion euros, which is pretty much 2.4% of GDP. And by definition, those stimulus packages that we are uh, investing in the economy, that was a European commitment that we made, are triple T. They are temporary, they're targeted, and they're timely. And all three T's matter, especially in the context of sustained and solid public finances that we will have to restore, as we all know, after the crisis uh, is gone and growth has been restored. Those stimulus packages clearly are important, and for those that are worried about public intervention, uh, try to remember uh, the quote by uh, um, President Roosevelt, who during his campaign uh, Denouncing what the prior administration had done, or rather had not done, he said that the nation had been, and I quote again, afflicted with hear nothing, see nothing, do nothing government. That might remind you of the Chinese monkey. Yeah. Well, confronted with a crisis of equal magnitude, I would say, certainly we cannot afford to repeat the same mistake. And around the world, uh, governments have heard the complaints, they've seen the issues, and they certainly are doing what is possible to do in order to stir on the crisis. The coordinated plans to stimulate the world economy provide ample proof of that. Now what is unprecedented uh, today is clearly the consensus that we have to, in addition to stimulate the economy, which was clearly shared by all those participating in the G20 meeting in London under the excellent chairmanship of uh, the, um, um, the Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, and prior to that prepared by Alistair Darling, my colleague, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. The consensus is that we cannot just do that, and we also need to uh, overall finance industry regulation. Now. You might all think, okay, the, here is France, here is continental Europe, all they want to do is regulate. Not to the point. What we absolutely have to do is that we put in place better, more comprehensive regulation so that what has happened and what has actually caused the crisis to happen does not happen again. 
And certainly that was the determination of the G20 in London. Now, some of you again might argue that the G20 is irrelevant and the only thing that matters is actually the G7. Those who think that are clearly making a mistake and are not seeing that the map of the world has changed, that the map of the, the, map of the economic powers has changed and that clearly the determination is not going to be the same ever again. Not to say that the G7 is gone and story of the past, not to say that it becomes irrelevant, but simply to underline the fact that the world is different and that economic powers such as India, such as Brazil, such as China have a say, have a seat and certainly have something to do about restoring confidence and stimulating growth and certainly also about stabilizing the system. This is exactly what we agreed to do. And it's not a surprise that as part of the communique you find one sentence which is the two sentences that are critical. The whole communique matters and a lot of the requirements, a lot of the uh, suggestions are, are, are critical. But the two sentences that in my view matter a lot. The first one is the one that tries to diagnose uh, what happened and it says the following. It says major failures in the financial sector and in financial regulations are described as fundamental causes of the crisis. The second sen sentence, I'll, I'll, come to, I'll come to it in a minute. And subsequent to that, uh, the, the G20 decided not only to s put regulation as the sort of second key objective after stimulating the economy and restoring growth, but it adds to it not something which is an attachment, but something which is a statement by the G20 leaders, which includes six pages of recommendations, guidance, and the things that need to be done to restore a stable financial system. Now, there is certainly back to my question, a bit of a French touch about some of the, uh, some of the communique. Uh, I would say about the G20 itself, and it's not so much a French touch, but it was a European touch, and I was personally party to that meeting that took place in Camp David, when President Sarkozy, as President of uh, Europe at the time, uh, convinced President uh, George W. Bush that we had to have a G20 meeting and that that meeting should take place sooner rather than later, hence the meeting that took place in Washington in November. Now, I would also suggest that there was a bit of a French uh, touch when we very strongly insisted on the second sentence, which in my view in the communique is also very important, and it says the following, all financial markets, products and participants should be regulated or subject to oversight. And it is our strong belief that we can only efficiently and in a sustainable fashion restore growth if it goes hand in hand with the restoration and restabilization of the financial system as well. I don't like to quote too many people, and I have already, but frankly, uh, on, this, on this occasion it won't be a quote, but it will be sort of a borrowing from someone uh, that you all know. But in, you know, never uh, in such a short period of time, so much wealth has been destroyed to the detriment of so many. And I was going to add by so few, but that remains to be seen. And I don't think that we can allow a return to just business as usual, let's forget about the crisis, put everything under the carpet and go back to old practices. To give you a bit of background, I certainly, uh, with, together with my German colleagues, uh, worked hard on building some of those proposals together with uh, my UK colleague uh, and, and the three of us, we worked very hard so that at the uh, European uh, council that took place just before uh, April the second meeting, there was sufficient strong consensus to push for certain changes that actually were underlined at the G20 uh, meeting. And let me come back to that now, those new regulation and that comes to the question that you ask. There's no doubt that business and capital, money, uh, will move around, has probably never moved around as fast as it did as fast as it does and as fast as it will. It should stay that way and it will be that way because technology supports it. But there is a consensus 
on the fact that there should be greater and more importantly better regulation to deal with the crisis and to deal with the post-crisis and I hope that Lord Turner will address those issues. I'm sure that he will because he's uh, volunteered some terrific proposals to that end. But if we do that on a regional basis within Europe for instance or on a national basis in the UK or in Germany or in France or in the US or in Japan, it won't be enough because we will produce a fragmented system that will again entice players because it's their natural tendency to arbitrage between various forums and to do forum shopping. So if we were to do that, in my view, the cure would be just worse than the disease and it would certainly endanger uh, the likelihood of a restabilization of financial system and restoration of, of growth. So what does the G20 done? It has very wisely called for an international regulatory roadmap to precisely address that uh, risk. The approach agreed is in my view both realistic and cooperative. And the G20 has, uh, the G20 has agreed to rely on international bodies in charge of international cooperation and in charge of standard setting. Who are they? Well, clearly the newly expanded um, Financial Stability Board. Remember, it, was to be, it, it used to be the Financial Stability Forum, the FSF. It's no longer the FSF, it's the FSB. And the fact that it is a board is probably not irrelevant and clearly indicates and signals that there is empowerment underway. The good thing about it is that it is enlarged, and I'll come back to that a bit later on. What other bodies are, are going to be in charge of really providing that international roadmap and the various signals and the various gateways that are necessary along the way? Clearly the Basel Committee, Josco as well, and all of those will have to make sure that implementation of the decisions are on our agenda. Why should that be? Because we cannot, we simply cannot afford the risk of fragmentation. Because we reopen the nice road to arbitrage, forum shopping, that will be detrimental to proper and stable financial, uh, financial system. Okay, let me now sort of uh, go down to a bit more details concerning uh, how comprehensive the regulation should be. Don't forget the sentence, all territories, all institutions, all bodies, Needless to say, all products should be either regulated or supervised, and possibly both, if their scope, their magnitude, their size gives them a systemic importance. So the regulation must be comprehensive. <coughs> Let me move to terri territories first. One of the um, most mediatized um, aspect of this G20, because it was sort of the last, the last inning, if you want, was the issue of territories and the issue of non-cooperative uh, uh, centres, also called tax havens. In the G20, we succeeded, we succeeded um, through protracted negotiations at the end in having the OECD publish a list of the non-cooperative centres, non-cooperative jurisdictions. What was the immediate effect of that? Well, in a matter of days after that, those countries, because the listing of the OECD provides three categories of countries, the white ones, you know, the sort of clean and above board, the grey ones that need to deliver, that need to, you know, demonstrate that they are actually uh, responding to the expectations of the international community and the black ones that completely ignore the rules and that never supply information when any country in the world has tax suspicions that one of their taxpayer is actually evading and frauding uh, the national tax system to which he or she or it is subject. So don't get me wrong on this issue of the non-cooperative centres. I'm not challenging the authority and the right of any sovereign state to lower hire uh, or, or, or keep its taxation system as it wish. That's, that's an attribute of sovereignty. But what we were challenging and, that, and what we are challenging and will continue to challenge is the ability that certain states have affo afforded themselves to simply say, no, we will not provide information when there is a legitimate suspicion by another uh, state that there is actual fraud. So what happened? Those countries that were in the blacklist under the OECD uh, ranking, 
declared immediately that they were going to actually go by the rule and comply with the criteria set by the Global Forum of the OECD, which deals with those tax issues. And as a result, would commit to sign at least 12 agreements with other countries to deliver information uh, if and when required. Now, that in and of itself is a pretty good result. And to me, that is the beginning of the end of bank secrecy. Much more needs to be done. It was a big blow because the list was out. That's not the only list. We also need the list of those countries that actually protect money laundering, and we need a list of those countries that do not comply with prudential standards. Nobody ever can support money laundering. Nobody can be in favor of tax evaders. Nobody can be in favor of those terrorists that actually get their funding through those, uh, those uh, channels. So more needs to be done in that field. More needs to be done as well concerning the enforcement. Because it's all very well having those lists and those in grey, but we would certainly hope that those in the grey list would move to the white list. And clearly we want the FSB to continue to play a role in that regard. And we want the uh, GAFI, I forgot what the initials are in, in, uh, in, in English, but anyway, it's this organization that checks uh, the money laundering schemes and that identifies those countries uh, that do not comply with the rules. So we want them to come up with the, with the list. We have the OECD, we want the FSB, and we want GAFI to also provide the same, uh, the same uh, tools. And that's not enough, because we also need to define what sanctions and what will be the toolbox of uh, governments to actually go about those that do not want to comply. So much for territories. Second, as I said, all institutions. Now, all institutions, I'll take two examples. Number one, the hedge funds. Number two, the rating agencies. On the hedge funds, some of the uh, experts, particularly in this, countries, in this country, have said to me, well, why bother about the hedge funds? Because they have not created the crisis, after all. Which is true. But equally, the hedge funds total about $1.2 trillion in asset under management at the moment. And they clearly use the banking channels uh, for their operations. Now, now that governments are called upon supporting the banks, we must make sure that tomorrow those banks will not be undermined by entities that are amongst their most important clients, about which we have zero information. So, to that end, uh, the G20 has advocated that uh, members adopt a regulatory framework that requires hedge funds to register, to increase their transparency, and you know, to explain how they invest, while also monitoring bank exposure to hedge funds. And we've tasked uh, the FSB, it's clearly on the to-do list of, of them, we've tasked the FSB and the IMF to come up with criteria in order to define what is a hedge fund of systemic importance, or when does a hedge fund become of, becomes of systemic importance so that we have that level of clarity, transparency and expectations. I think we also made, uh, and, and by the way, uh, there is currently a proposed uh, regulation at the European level which has not yet been put to Parliament, but the draft of which certainly I'm not happy with because I don't think that it actually responds to the requirements of transparency, control and, and appropriate supervision for hedge fund that becomes of systemic uh, importance. The second area which I want to also to touch on as far as institutions are concerned uh, uh, are the rating agencies. Again, the, the G20 communique calls upon uh, more, um, more principles better supervised. More principles, that means registration of rating agencies, the avoidance of conflict of interest embedded in the articles and actually enforced by the rating agencies, uh, the compliance with the international code of practice, and a differentiation between the rating of, say, states, um, structured products, uh, or uh, bonds, because we simply cannot mix them all together, and if we expect them, and we need them, if we expect them to provide appropriate ranking, then we need that level of distinction. Moving on to my uh, third uh, example of uh, how regulation needs to be comprehensive, I'll uh, say a few words about individuals. As much as rating agencies matter, mattered, and many others, for, I believe, uh, in sort of 
either generating or encouraging uh, and accelerating the crisis. I think that the compensation schemes that have been put in place and that were the pleasure of uh, many for many years have to be restructured. And I'm not here saying that people should necessarily make less money. What I'm saying here is that the compensation systems to be put in place must take into account the passing of time and that we cannot have traders, for instance, uh, grab nice annual bonuses, sometimes guaranteed bonuses, quite often actually, uh, without completion of the transactions and without making sure that there is a clear link between performance and compensation. The G20 has set clear guidelines to that effect and certainly, for instance, my country, uh, I've asked the uh, Bank Bankers Association to come up with sound principles that would determine better compensation system, n systems not likely to induce uh, the behaviours that actually encourage the crisis. Now, to do that clearly, we need we need players because there is no project without budget. There is no completion without champions, and the champions, I think, we have them uh, available. Those are international organisations that clearly need to be empowered and that have been enlarged. There's been a lot of discussion about the too big to fail. There's been a lot of discussions about the too big to manage. And clearly there is a big discussion, and there should be, about the too big to supervise. And that's where clearly supervision needs to be, number one, very close to the ground so that it is efficient. And that pleads for national uh, implementation. But it needs to be extremely well coordinated with some degree of uh, close coordination to the point where it can actually signal an arbitrage uh, when there are issues between national uh, supervisors and that is clearly something that the Financial Stability Board must be involved with. The G20 has also emphasized the need to strengthen our international financial institutions to begin with the IMF. Uh, the IMF, as you remember, has benefited from a tripling of its resources. Uh, it's important, why is it? Those of you will remember that two years ago, we were wondering whether the IMF should continue lending, simply because most of the loans had been reimbursed. So why should the IMF carry on do that? Well, if you look at how much the IMF is lending at the moment, and if you look at the list of beneficiaries, we were plain wrong two years ago. The amount lent is significant, will grow, and the beneficiaries do not include just least developed countries, sub-Saharan African countries, but many countries in many different places around the world. And it will be so simply because some countries have public finances and uh, balances of payments that absolutely need the support of an international financial institution. In addition to that, we are tasking the IMF to actually identify risk and to monitor. So to that end, it's not unfair that the IMF be uh, not only endowed with a lot more money, and uh, I was happy enough to sort of lighten myself with uh, 15 billion euros uh, that were um, Sorry, $15 billion makes a difference, actually, at the moment. $15 billion, uh, that was the French contribution, uh, part of the European uh, contribution to the fund. But it's also important that that body be more representative and better representative of its constituency. And its constituency, as you know, is large. It doesn't include Cuba, but pretty much everybody else on the planet. And clearly, there are players that need to have a better, stronger, and uh, bigger representation. I'm sure that, that will be the case for long debates in the weeks and months to come, but it shouldn't come too late. Now, I regard both, uh, by the way, I also mentioned earlier on that the, uh, the FSB, uh, it, not only is it uh, and, you know, tasked with many other things to do, but it is also enlarged. And all representatives of the G20 and uh, Spain uh, are now member of the uh, of the FSB, which is a good thing. So we have those two institutions, the FSB and the IMF, both with good representation. Uh, one of them endowed with massive budget uh, to actually support uh, countries that are suffering, and the two of them cooperating in order to set standards on the one hand and make sure that it's implemented on the other hand. Now, final point, which is uh, certainly dear to my heart and on which I think uh, we still have a lot to do, is on the accounting standards. Um, it, it may sound technical and I will not go into too many details. Suffice to say that uh, 
and without questioning uh, the fair value uh, principle, mark to market and all the rest of it. Uh, certainly uh, the International Accounting Standard Board has a lot of homework to do and has a lot of homework to do in the short term as well as in the long term to make sure that we can actually agree on consistent, comprehensive standards that apply across the board so that we can actually compare carrots and carrots and cabbage with cabbage and not the other way around on mixing the two, which would make a nice soup but a complete mess in my view. So. Uh, we will certainly pursue that. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the Europeans are very much together on that page and that we certainly want uh, the, the, FA, the FASB and the, the IASB to work much uh, more closely together and to have at least the same level of efficiency, uh, to say the least. The few things that absolutely need to be done, one is the issue of assessing the value of assets in a market that doesn't exist, where the mark-to-market principle simply cannot work. And second, there is the issue of dynamic provisioning, which has been adopted by some countries, such as Spain, for instance, and which actually works, uh, which allows a bank to actually build reserves uh, um, during, you know, good times, so that in down times it is, it is you know, it has, it has sufficient cushion. This is really what I wanted to say, Mr. Chairman, um, and to sort of come back to my uh, neo-Colbertism as, uh, as uh, prescribed by my friend Lord Mendelssohn, uh, I would suggest that I don't think that the world has, has become French, no, neither would I want you to think uh, that the French are dead against uh, free market, dead against liberalism and dead against the principle advocated by Milton Friedman. Quite to the contrary, France is definitely uh, a free market economy, uh, one that is uh, certainly more open than many, many economies around the world, if I judge by the number of foreign direct investors, uh, and certainly one where there has been a lot less of the industry and a lot less of the economy that is under national control than in many other places, including possibly in this beautiful country that I uh, love so much. So I would suggest that actually what has happened is that Mr. Colbert, the Minister of Economy and Finance of Louis XIV, who himself was a strong advocate of building and manuf manufacture and, and, and supporting the economy and actually building uh, champions, I think that Mr. Colbert has actually come to the rescue of Milton Friedman so that we can actually make sure that this free market economy survives but that it has proper principles and proper rules that are necessary for all players to have a chance to succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Thank you for those remarks. Um, mm. I'm conscious we've got a certain amount of time, and I know you don't have a lot of time, um, and also we, we will want to get on to the next panel. So what I'd like to do um, is to take some questions, uh, perhaps group them, if that's all right, around the floor. I think if we go one-on-one, -on -one, if you don't mind, we're going to end up with a long conversation and find it difficult uh, to be able to get as much in as we can. Uh, you've laid out a very strategic perspective, and uh, if I may say so, you focused on what was maybe the second issue, the, the financial regulation, making sure these mistakes don't happen again. Uh, and clearly from the presentation you've given, the French government's given a huge amount of thought to the ability to, to make the most out of a bad crisis, I suppose, uh, and, and, and put in place some changes that will have long-term impact. I presume the bulk of the questions will, will focus on that. If they do, I've got a couple of extra things I'd like to throw in at the end. But let me please uh, invite you... Uh, I'm going to look at really literally the first four hands I see um, and get some questions in from the floor and then what I'll do is uh, give you a chance to reply and as I said maybe throw a question of mine in as well very quickly. I can see one question at the front. There are microphones coming and if you could just say uh, what your name is, uh, so who you work for, so the minister is, is well apprised of that. My name is Lindsay Case and I'm a Chatham House member so that's my main focus and Sorry. the question is primarily <coughs> We're on a frontier, as you said, where money's moving so globally fast. And is the modern future so convergent to where, like in the Wikipedia model, all those puzzles are coming together? At what point are we talking about pretty much universal globalized flow, monitoring? I mean, is that the level playing field you're referring to, in a sense? I'm trying to see what 20 years, 2020 looks like, or 2050. So, might we have a global regulator, I think, was, is it, was one of the big questions that's come up here. I can see a question at the table there. If you can see, please go back on this side of the room. Go back, keep going, keep going, keep going. Does man, if you please keep your hand up, please, man. Thank you. 
Good morning, thank you. Uh, Jennifer Harris, U.S. Department of State. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on whether the G20 is an appropriate vehicle to address global imbalances and, and how much just fundamental imbalances between probably, if we're honest, what is the G2 or the G20 um, ramifies into the broader kind of financial regulation concerns and, and yeah, again, so if, uh, if the G20 is an appropriate vehicle there. All right, so the global imbalance question. I have a question right at the front here. If you could bring a microphone down here, please. And just while the microphone is coming, something that was noticed is when President Obama said that you know, we can't rely on the U.S. consumer for being the, the consumer of last resort in the future. And in that sense, the imbalance is obviously a big question for the future. Yeah. Minister Jim Walsh um, with Prisma Capital Partners is a fund of hedge funds. Um, as we approach the issue of regulation and repairing, uh, are we likely to spend enough time to sort out what were systemic problems and what were people just not following the rules that already were in place? I think with those three questions, literally on time, uh, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll stop with those from the floor. If I could just ask you one uh, question about taking stock about where are we now from a European perspective. Uh, Central Eastern Europe, how concerned are you, Minister, uh, that within Europe's own backyard that there is a problem that perhaps is not fully um, been taken care of yet, which could still come back and bite us? Four big topics. I don't know how much time you've got, but uh, we'll let you bite at those. Okay. Um, on, on, on the issue of the global regulator and how, how centric uh, should the system be. I'm personally more in favor of a concentric system where you have different circles. Uh, why is that? Because I believe that we should put in place a system that will work, that will be efficient, not one that will satisfy um, either the ego or the, the talent of a grand designer. So my belief is that uh, it should be rooted as close to the ground as possible, as close to the players as possible, but equally we must have a set of rules, a set of general principles, the one that will matter most, that are agreed upon and that are, uh, you know, to which everybody is committed, all supervisors around. Equally there should be a sufficient degree of supervision and coordination so that in case of disagreement about the definition, about the enforcement, uh, about the priority, then that coordination circle can actually determine in the general interest of all players what is actually the right definition, what is the uh, ranking of priorities, so that we don't fall back into the trap of this arbitrage for my own backyard because I want to protect my forum. I know it's a complicated system, but clearly there's so many bright brains around this, uh, this construction that if they can each forget a little bit about their respective interest, we should be able to design a system that works. But my primary concern is that we build something that actually works. I'll give you an example. On the, for instance, on the definition of equity, of, of uh, uh, core equity for banks. Even within Europe, where we have regulations, where we have directives, where we have an, you know, the, the set of rules, the definitions will differ from one country to the other. And we saw that very clearly when, for instance, I was involved in the, um, together with my Belgium and Luxembourg colleague, when we were involved in the restructuring reorganization of Dexia, which was a, a, a tree national bank, if you will. The definition of, of uh, tier one equity was, was not the same. And, th and that's only a small example, and I'm sure that there are many uh, around, um, especially if you go beyond Europe. I mean, within Europe we're making this you know, massive effort to sort of all point in the same direction. Uh, but, but clearly that's, um, that's a, big, a big, big issue. Now, is the G20 the appropriate forum to deal with global imbalances? Uh, the, the two areas where clearly a lot of attention will have to be paid in the future. It's that of the global imbalances, if we want to think about an exit strategy, and it's clearly as part of the process of the global imbalances, the issue of currencies. Those have not been really touched on in the last uh, G20 communique, simply because it was not the priority and the urgency of the moment. But we will have to come back to that. Now, whether it is the G20, an evolution of the G20, uh, I don't know. 
but it has to group all major players. And we cannot live on the definition of major player as understood 20, 10 or even 5 years ago. The world has changed and the voices of the world are different. So we need to account for that and we need to be as encompassing as we can if we want this thing to work. Again, I'm totally obsessed with implementation, efficiency and, and you know, making sure that it's going to fly. Where are we between um, the systemic uh, aspect and those that have not followed the rules? Uh, I don't know whether we are sufficiently advanced, but I'm sure that we will at some stage get there because any event of that nature needs a post-mortem. Uh, there's some of it being done at the moment so that we can actually you know, redress the ship and make sure that it, it goes in the right direction. Uh, but I hope soon enough we have that uh, analysis of what went wrong, why it went wrong, who was asleep uh, at, uh, at the will. And, and my intuition, call it feminine or not, but my intuition is that many, many of all the players that should have been concerned, that should have raised their hands, uh, either did not or did to a limited extent because it was within their own perimeter and they did not take sort of the bird eye view of what was happening. But just like in the Enron case where we eventually found out that the board, uh, the auditors, the lawyers, the supervisors, that people didn't see. But we need to understand why and who actually did not. Now Central and Eastern Europe, I would caution you against the sort of easy um, <coughs> sort of encompassing mm -hmm. um, word, Central and Eastern Europe. And, and, and I can see you, 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 you're nodding, you know exactly where I'm coming from. Not all Central and Eastern European countries are in the same basket at all. And if you analyze the current situation of, say, Poland or the Czech Republic, compare it with Hungary or Bulgaria, it is not the same. Um, and obviously on the top of that, you need to think about the Baltic states. So. Beware of generalizing, uh, you know, Central Eastern Europe. I don't think that's the, the the right approach. I think we need to think about countries that are in a difficult uh, financial situation. There are uh, countries, as you know, that are currently uh, having the benefit of uh, IMF and European support. That is the case for Hungary. That is the case for Romania. Um, and we have in place at the IMF clearly with a tripling of its resources and within the European Union with a, a very large increase of the facility that we can use for uh, outside Eurozone members and vicinity states, we have in place uh, tools and funds to actually support and, and, and rescue those states that would be uh, would, would be um, encountering great difficulties. So it's, it's a process. Uh, it's one where clearly everybody has to play its role, including local governments. Um, I'm here thinking about the vicinity rather than inside the European Union. Uh, but we are clearly uh, on alert and we, and we are very vigilant to make sure that we act, if and when necessary, on a joint basis with the IMF. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister, for those remarks. Uh, before we let you go, and I know you have to go on to your next remarks, uh, your next, uh, sorry, engagements. Um, uh, these were, I think, very fulsome, uh, strategic uh, set of uh, ideas that you've laid out here. Clearly, they're going to be a key part of the agenda as we go forward. Um, there will be this constant to and froing between the long term uh, and the nearer term, but certainly in terms of laying out a long term agenda, that's something you've, you've, you've laid out. I hope we can carry on working with you. My colleague, Paolo Subaki, here has been working with the Atlantic Council. I know Jennifer uh, came in here before, made one of her remarks on this to try and look at a long term G20 agenda where we're looking beyond just the near term but at the strategic questions, including currencies, including imbalances. Uh, and I suspect the G20 agenda is one that's going to get bigger uh, into the future. We hope we can carry on working with you uh, in that case and look forward to you participating in events with FPA, with uh, BAB, and with Chatham House again. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you.